whatever. Yeah, when uh, <clears throat> one time our patrol, many a times we would sur swerve to actually try to hit people or kids, and uh, one of our drivers missed, and he opened his door, and he hit this child with his door, and these doors are plated with with a lot of armor, they're really heavy. Just to pick up the door by itself, <coughs> it almost takes two men to do it, to put the door on onto the hinge. And uh, these doors are just really heavy. And a moving vehicle opening his door and swinging it out and hitting this kid, um, I'm, I'm sure the kid must have died. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in the truck, I was on the gun in the truck behind the truck that did it. And we finally pulled up to the base that we were headed to, we were on an escort mission. And uh, you know the, the TC, came around and was screaming and yelling at the kid that did it. And I was like, thank God, you know, something is being done. And, uh, you know, the kid was left alone, and he's pissed off that he got yelled at. And, you know, I was, at, I was asked him about it, and he said that he got in trouble because he endangered himself and his crew by opening the door. There could have been a possible IED. <laughs> and it was at a time where we had to start rolling up our windows and make sure our windows were up because the windows were, were bulletproof and, and uh, blast proof from IEDs. We couldn't ride with our windows down even though it was 140 degrees out. And uh, you know, I was just sad to see that that was the reason why this, this soldier was getting in trouble. And uh, we set up these Geneva Conventions and these rules of engagement, but really it's just a liability. The truth is once you're on the ground, um, there's an unspoken uh, rules of engagement, unspoken Geneva Conventions that we start to abide by. And we stick to the book and that we say that we're following the book, but you're with all these guys and something might happen and, you know, it's, it's very difficult to blame the soldier that's to the left of you after he does this atrocity because you're all there, you're all dealing with this crap and, you know, you know, fundamentally, it's not this kid's fault that he's there and doing these horrible things. You know that it's the policy and the fact that you're there all together that's what's wrong with this thing. And you wish you could take all of you and, you know, take them back home, but you're just stuck there. And, uh, you know, I, I remember this one uh, this one time we were at JC, JCC. It's a joint command center. It's kind of where they put all the mayor's office and uh, the courthouse and the police station, all kind of in this one conglomerated area that, that's easily defended by the Iraqi army. We always used to go up there and check on things, or we used to pull in there to rest because it's semi-secure. And on one end, at, at the JCC in Calice, one of the little towns that we used to uh, always go through, um, there's an elementary school. And uh, the elementary school is completely overcrowded. Almost all the kids uh, just played soccer all day in the field. And it was like 50 against 60 you know, um, in this little dirt soccer field uh, with cut off palm trees as the goalposts. And uh, they used to let the kids go through the JCC to get to school because they thought it was safer than them going around on the outside. And uh, there was some, some uh, Christian organization that gave this entire town all the kids backpacks. So they had these stupid squarish blue backpacks that no American kid would have like the courage to wear. That every single Iraqi kid had these backpacks, and uh, you know, I used to, uh, I used to actually inspect some of their their school books and look at them. And you know, some of them didn't have school books. I asked them why, and they said their their father burnt them for fire or for heat or for cooking or whatever. Or they just didn't have them, and we just look at the pictures or whatever and talk about it. And I just try to engage the kids. And uh, one day, uh, I was on the other side of the JCC, and the kids were coming through. I remember feeling kind of sad that I didn't get to interact with the kids that day because I was on their side on guard, and uh, one of the kids exploded. I guess uh, somebody put a bomb in, in one of these squarish black packs, and um, they they detonated the kid when he got up to that, up to our Humvees, and uh, <coughs> everybody hit the ground, and, and you know, the kids kids scattered. Uh, I think five of the five of the little kids were killed in the blast, and just one of our soldiers were injured. And uh, I ran up to the Humvee, and I was just on the other side of the Humvee that got hit. And uh, I ran up to it, and one of the kid's arms was on the opposite side of the Humvee. It must have just blown over the Humvee and landed. And uh, I don't know, I don't know why. I must have felt a little guilty about it, or just something was going through my mind. And I kicked it under the Humvee just to kind of get rid of it. Maybe I didn't want anybody else to see it. And I kicked it underneath the Humvee when I got there. And uh, I was checking out our guys, and then we started doing triage on the little kids, and the medics finally came in, and I kind of backed up. And uh, it took almost hours to just clean all this crap up. And, 
you know, a lot of the guys were just laughing about it, about the way the kids blew up and uh, what I mean, you just learn to laugh at some horrible stuff when you're at war. It must be just a psychological way of dealing with something so horrific that you learn to laugh at it. But they cleaned all this up. They got the bodies gone and, and put them in bags and stuff. And after they left, it was about 15 minutes later, I, I remembered the arm underneath the Humvee. And I was like, oh shit. You know, they just took these kids away and all they cleaned it all up and this arm was still there. And I looked under and I got the arm out and I showed it to my sergeant. And uh, he pointed over at the trash pile. And I was like, I'm not going to throw this kid's arm away. We should figure out who it belongs to. And the guy, the guy took the arm and walked it over to the trash pile and threw it on the trash pile. And, you know, that, that was that. So, you know, it's just, just a very skewed environment. People, you know... We just you just lose your mind. You don't know how to deal with things properly. And I've been in firefights where after it was over, you know, most of the firefights I, I've been in, you know, I was a sniper, but I did a lot of scout missions, so I was, I was a gunner on a Humvee a lot of times. And usually we'd see a muzzle flash off in the distance. We didn't even see anybody. It was usually night. And we'd just see the muzzle flash and uh, maybe some pinks on our Humvees if they were lucky enough to, to even get close. And we would just stop the trucks. We'd have four Humvees, which was pretty much a minimum of what you can drive out with. On top of each Humvee is a heavy automatic weapon, Mark 19 possibly, which is a fully automatic belt-fed grenade launcher where you hold down the butterfly and grenades shoot out the other end at an effective range of 2,000 meters. A uh, 50 caliber machine gun where the bullets leave the barrel and they actually swell to the size of uh, salt shakers. And, uh, you know, 240 Bravos that are one of the most rapid-firing machine guns we have in the military all trained on wherever this muzzle flash was coming from and just shooting and engaging. And uh, a lot of times these guys would just fire off a couple shots, get down and run. Before we even stopped, the guy's gone. And he must have hit her behind, you know, usually a house that didn't belong to him. And we just lit up the entire house and just destroyed the house. And we kick off on, uh, you know, after all the firing was done, you know, we kick off on little missions and just kind of raid the house. We kick in the front door, look through the area, just turn the place over. Usually we found innocent people inside, you know, mom and dad dead, little Johnny, little Mary dead, you know, and there's nothing you really do about it. You know, it's all collateral damage in, in the scheme of things. Well, that's kind of shit that sticks with you. And you go through that and I see guys laughing, I see guys crying, I see guys praying, I see guys cursing, you know, all, all have experienced the same exact thing, you know, but everybody's kind of reacting different to it. So it's, it's just kind of a jumbled mess, and it's chaotic. And it's not like the movies where everybody's moving in an organized way. Most of our combats were, you know, where we were in firefights was basically we were all just shitting ourselves. And our training and our love for the men that we're fighting with is the only thing that keeps us in check from just turning around and running and just leaving it all behind. And you try to squeeze yourself into, you know, hiding behind a signpost that you know you can't hide behind. But you're trying, you know, you're trying the best you can. And uh, it's just a scary and uh, 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 chaotic mess. And uh, the rules of engagement, they go out the window. The Geneva Conventions, they go out the window. If I could drop a nuclear missile on some of these towns when I was in a firefight, just of pure fear of what was going on, I would have done it just to end it all right there. And uh, these commanders that have these weapons available, like uh, white phosphorus and MK-77, which is the modern-day uh, napalm, um, you know, they use them because they're responsible for getting these kids home alive. And often that becomes their sole mission in Iraq.